the earlier stages of the game. I think there is a bit of onus on BDD to get his mid lane under wraps and allow Clear to get around his jungle and possibly mitigate the push that Kana is going to put out because topside is certainly yeah, going so to be where T1 can focus. They don't have a lot of CC uh, to augment this. However, Sion is a, uh, a lumbering gentleman up there. Hitting him with a spear is Super easier easy. than a lot of other champions. Yeah, I really like T1's draft way more than Genji's here, Atlas. I feel like their comp is so good at team fighting later on with the poke. We know that Zoe is one of Faker's better champions this year. I mean, he's had one of his most famous team fights this season oh, yeah. on the champion, and this is a, a, a play style where T1 can really showcase their identity as a team. You know, you have Teddy Senna, you have Zoe for Faker, and Kana gets to play an aggressive top matchup where he's just shooting at a tank, and that's that makes it very stable for him, and they can have kill pressure up there, they can draw a lot of the attention away. I feel like Gen.G really need to make something happen early with Ruler's Callista here. They really need to control the bot side, try to maybe even snowball that to an advantage, but I feel like that's going to be so difficult here. With Tom Kench being played by Karia, how do you really find those angles? I mean, it's an early game that's strong for Callista, but can you really push that into an advantage enough to get you ahead to snowball this game? The Scion pick in particular just feels like it really isn't going to thematically go with the rest of this team later on in the game. Yeah, Scion certainly is sort of their scaling option here, but gives them hard engage, and Genji needs hard engage if they're going to take down T1. This has to be decisive from Genji. What did we see last game? We saw slow, slow. we saw come to us, and Wait. then maybe we'll fight, but actually we probably won't, and then we'll win the game. I actually think this is really smart from T1 as an adaptation to say, like, well, if you do just want to group up around objectives and then do nothing, we're going to throw a whole bunch of abilities at you and then you're going to have to leave. Yeah. And it's also a comp that's so strong against a high priority Callista pick. And, you know, the the power of Callista is in when she gets ahead and then she dominates those mid-game fights, the first few Drake fights in particular, the Rift Herald, she's able to get in on that fight. That's where she's going to be at her strongest. Senna takes a lot more time to come online. But the difference in what those two uh, AD carries can do in a 25-minute, 30-minute fight is so massively different. I mean, the range that Senna has, the poke that that she can play with, means that Ruler is going to be dead oftentimes before he can even get range, in range to auto if he gets hit by any of the Shock Blast, Spear, <laughs> Battle yeah. Stars, right? Like, it's very scary what Genji are going to have to try to put together if we do go to late game where they're even or behind. Oh. Bit of a battle here around this bottom brush. We've seen this everywhere. It just feels like everyone just wants to be fighting over bottom brushes. His face breaker onto Carrier. And his life is going to move real fast with his face rush and get himself out of the way. Teddy is undefeated, and Carrier is undefeated as well on the spot duo, by the way. Yeah, this combo is uh, pretty gross. And Carrier actually 100% pog rate as well for his uh, Tom Kent. Two for two is pretty nutty. It's pretty pog, you could even say. You could definitely say that. <laughs> it is very player of the game. Yep. As, uh, yep, Ruler and Life should certainly have some control in the early stage. Yes. Uh, like you say, I think the power of inevitability is on t one side. Despite the fact that it's a poke comp, we talk about poke comps uh, pretty gingerly oftentimes because they do take a lot of finesse to play correctly. But uh, T1, if they've showed anything, it's that even with bad drafts, they often find victories just because they are very good, even when they have narrow win conditions. As Faker take a, takes a bit of damage there from BDD, BDD doing that Syndra thing where you use all of your mana in order to get the shove. I feel like if there's almost anyone you can trust too, is this is a kind of a vacuum matchup that isn't going to matter too much. I think Khan has maybe messed this matchup up as well because he just wins these. Yeah. And uh, sometimes he's not supposed to. Is Haymaker there? Life keeping himself alive. As, uh, yeah, level two gained by Gen G, and that means that they were able to get a bit of extra control. I, and I do agree with you in that T1 have, you know, been able to pull off really, really hard to execute comps in the past. But I mean, historically, as an org, I mean, if you go back to the beginning of T1, back in the All Champions, right? Like, this team made a name for themselves for doing that. Baker made a name for himself for pulling off extreme plays, and he's done it already this season on the Zoe. If there's one player you can trust to, to hit the Paddle Stars when it matters most in the best of five, I mean, I think it's Faker, right? And this bot lane is going as expected. No surprises there. That's the power of this Callista pick. Yeah. You know, is this enough? I mean, you need to find more than just pushing waves into turrets. Yeah, I think I have to go back to, you know, some of the old adages when it comes to, you know, Senna X, you know, the fasting Senna compositions. Because we often saw them with, like, you hit a mid-game, and if your support is down 20 CS, 
you're psyched. You're still in a great spot, right? And uh, as, you know, late game comes around, of course, you know, the fame, Flame Horizon inevitably comes in, but you get so much value out of the combo that it is uh, just really good. Last time Teddy and Carrier played this, it was against Harmon Life Esports, and they won the lane, which didn't make any sense. Yes, no, me. it did not. Um, <laughs> that's not happening this time. No. However, it doesn't mean that things are necessarily bad for T1. That's just how this is supposed to go, especially against the early game power of a Callisto. Yeah, it's, it's extremely powerful with a Graves uh, jungle, too. You know, as we were mentioning, you have the ability to really follow up on some of those hard engages, post six and secure kills. That's what a ranged support is going to give you in this situation, more than, say, like, a do your might. So that's the one thing that's missing here for T1. It, we've seen so many Udyrs with the Zoe because it gives you such vision control. Lily's not bad at that, and especially into a Grave, she can be quite good, as hold that thought. Yeah, Terry taking a lot of damage here. Taking down low, has to use the exhaust to get Ruler out of it. Now Teddy able to follow up very nicely. Rend just to say no to Carrier, as the PS not going to do too much there, but here in this lane, right, Carrier can get all of his health back relatively comfortably. There is a Piercing Darkness to help him out there, and Gen.G a little bit more difficult to do so. We'll see whether T1 can utilize this as more of these little engages do happen. That being said, that 20 CS gap is already here at five minutes. Yeah. And, and it, uh, it, it that's not get... exactly the timing we wanted. Yeah, it might even get worse. Let's look at this Face Breaker. Yeah, two-man Face Breaker. Carrier in a little bit of trouble. Actually gets Haymade as well. Even going to come at the... Ooh, that was close. As now we're looking to try and get this dive on to Rascal. He flashes. Turret aggro picked up by Kuz and held on to absolutely beautifully. Great gank up there. And we mentioned that T1 playing around topside should be an inevitability and so far very successful. And they're playing around it so well. I mean, this bottom side of the map is super threatening for Gen.G, but you're not actually getting kills. You are going to get a Drake out of this. And even with a little bit of mid control here for Faker, there's just no way uh, that they can punish this. But the uh, Trade again here with six up. Yep, Kanner actually only needs a Shock Blast and an auto, and he's, he's just dead. Maybe just an Empowered Shock Blast. That was on cooldown, though, and now uh, Rascal. Rascal's going to go ha go home again. He lost his Flash. He has to go home. He doesn't have the Teleport anymore, and this is going to be the beginning of a massive lead for Kana. I mean, obviously, the, the Jace pick was really the beginning of that, but <laughs> we're, we're getting a little bit deeper here. Yeah. Is I mean, this game is going very much according to plan for T1 outside of that first streak. And I think you're okay with that because you, you give the Drake up, but your comp is going to fight so much better on the upcoming objectives that why what are you even worried about with that one? Oh, Genji, I think their spidey senses are tingling just a little bit here, understanding that there could be just another visit towards the top side. Rascal desperately trying to get towards his turret. Spear is going to miss. And Rascal's now just hopefully trying to deal with these minions. Oh no, Knockup does land onto Kuz. He's still got turret aggro, but he's able to hop out of the way to the skies from Kana. He has to flash. Is he just said no? Gets the level up just in time. Kuz going to look for one more spear. It's oh, not over yet. Oh, Rascal's going to get out of the way. Soul Furnace back available once again. And now Khalid's finally going to move on up. And that was Try very well played. Him. Very well played from Rascal. A little bit of extra turret aggro there on a Kuz as Teddy. Yep, a little bit of a snare there onto Life. Haymaker, though, keeps himself relatively healthy. Well, a lot of the tempo advantage they had on the top side of the map was lost with this um, extension that cost Kana his flash. Cuz keeps his, at least, is able to get away with that one. But that was a, a, definitely a huge moment for Rascal to take Kana's flash away and to take a, a breath. He's still behind, obviously, and this is still not going to be a happy time. But oh, it could have been, it could have just been completely over. Like, that could have been almost game ending if they get another kill there. They get to faster Eclipse and... You know, we've, we've seen this before. Yeah, and then Kana can group up and the Shockwave's, uh, you know, a two-shot on some of these uh, these carries from Gen G. That's when things get extraordinarily scary. That's when you, like, can never win any of the upcoming objective fights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, T1 have really turned this bot lane around. You know, it's really stabilized quite significantly down here. The six is coming up in just a moment. Yep, CS is still certainly going to be a control for Ruler, but you saw how the trades are working, right? Like. What uh, Santa Tom Kench does is it alleviates pressure. Like that is that is what is it's so good at. Look at this. And uh, Teddy and Carrier have been very good at it so far this season. Look at this roam too from Clid. Like that was right when Ruler was hitting six. You have the Fate's call. It was a really good opportunity. If T1 stayed for extra like one more second, try to get an extra plate, you actually punish that and get kills. But T1, they know the timing. They back away at the perfect moment. They get to crash the wave, and unfortunately, all that Clid's going to get is a ward removed <laughs> and yeah. a control ward placed. Does uh, give them a little bit more safety here and bottom side vision certainly available for Gen G as Kuz comes on over and uh, kills Clid's blast cone, but Clid not looking too upset about it. He's kind of taking a bit of damage here towards the top side after the trade. 
And uh, let's see whether Rascal can stabilize. It has been certainly in his wheelhouse, is now Cuz starting up the Rift Herald. Look at the timing of this too. Yeah, right Teddy gets in, well, out of vision. He is just seen. Things come down. Glid cannot contest. He's going to look for a smite steal. Oh, -ho! okay. That's not, <laughs> not, he just walks up to it and says thanks. Okay, well, uh, that's uh, that's one way of losing the Rift Herald. We'll that's they unbelievable. They can get the eye, though. That's unbelievable that happened, Atlas. Like, he oh, actually no. just walks up and takes it. Yeah, Cuz going to have to try and get out of the way here as cleared. But BDD finally there. The train leaves the station. I don't think anyone... Oh, yes, it was. So uh, the drive-by collection of the eye was uh, successful there for Rascal. And he wants this, right? He wants to be able to get that plate gold so this Scion can reach relevance a whole lot earlier. Yeah, it's really important to actually get that early on. And this is actually a tightrope that Clid walked. I mean, we talk about Professional League of Legends as being a very calculated game, but when you're actually able to just know that you can walk forward and hope for a 50-50 smite steal to then fight for an Eye of the Herald, you know that your comp is going to struggle in the regular team fight, but you could still steal that away. That's a very impressive judgment here from Gen G. It was it was fairly low risk, right? And the reward is extremely high. Oh yeah, really I mean, appreciate to see C1 that play. were 50 ing and Gen G are like, well, I'll take those odds if you guys are going to do all of the all the the damage. Yeah, if you're going to do the heavy lifting, sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, straight up. <laughs> And it was a really good rotation, too, from T1. You know, they had Teddy there first. They started it early. But Genji does really good game sense. Play it out. And Clid's able to, to take some of that fire away. Yeah. I'll well, watch this one more time. Just walks up. Again, if you turn on Clid here, it becomes a more complicated problem. He just walks up and gets it. Kind of all ins, but he's able to get over the wall. Super easy, quick draw out. And then if you're T1 here, you're like, well, I feel like I need to make sure that they don't get this Rift Herald. They can't even deny that. They force a flash, Rascal does. I mean, this could not have gone better for Genji. Absolutely not. That is 100% stabilization here. No kill, of course. Uh, T1 still the only ones with that one, but it's onto the Scion, who's just happy, happily mitigating as much pressure as he can. And now Rift Herald can be utilized. T1 getting a bit of a shove here on the top side of the map. We'll give some opportunities here for Genji to possibly find some aggression bottom side as our ruler is going to be also gifted some of this uh, plate gold. Yeah, there's just no way you can mitigate this and they also have the Rift Herald drop. They're going to try to turn this into a Drake play as well. Like, it feels like Genji are just out macroing here. The value Teddy's getting on the top side is extremely mitigated. Even now with BDD showing up, he's going to get even less. This is definitely a trade that you want to take as Genji. Is it good enough for their composition later on? It's hard to say right now, it's hard to judge. But with the two Drake advantage, the extra gold that's given over to Ruler now, I mean, it's about as good as it gets without having a, you know racked up several kills. <laughs> I mean, that's, with zero kills, I think this is the biggest advantage you could really hope for. Genji no, really true. not losing out on a whole lot here. Oh, question Earth, is, will it be enough? Fire. Earth, Wind, and Fire comes in as, the, it's of course, Cloud Soul. You're welcome, everyone. <laughs> um, I sort of uh, took a bit of a timeout in the first game. Just wanted to give you guys a more fun soul. But uh, now, finally, I do have to do what I do, which is Cloud Souls. Could be a long series, you know. It could be more opportunities for you to give us more. Yeah, no, I, I think so, too. I think there is certainly a chance here. As T1, they're only down 100 gold. And scaling is a weird conversation to have. Uh, th these are two very different comps, right? Yes. Like, last game, it was two scaling comps. One of them scaled good up, right? Yeah. It and was kind of a A rank versus S rank scaling. Yeah. And so both of them are trying to do the same thing, which means then the, the comp that does it better is going to win, right? This isn't as cut and dry. This is T1 with a poke composition. They want to set up. They want to avoid Gen G's engage and then make it so that their health bars are too low for them to continue fighting. They also then have infinite scaling on center, so that, that's definitely good value for them too. However, that's not the identity of the composition. Gen G, though, they do have a hell of a lot of engage options, right? They can drive a train in, they can search for scatter the weeks, and also life can flank and go for really crazy engages and then just get fates called out, right? They have a lot of ability to cause a ruckus. They just have to do it. And the, that's not what Genji have been doing so far this year. Yeah, they have not. But it, it, this is a really different style of drafting, as you said. And what's really cool about the two Drake lead is it means some of those... Oh, uh, does. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, just a little scuffle there. Yeah. Uh, well, I was making was, a scary amount of damage. <laughs> yeah, I was like a little bit worried for a second. But what's really interesting is that because Genji have these two Drakes in the lead and the fact that it's a Cloud Soul, so it's not that significant um, in terms of the control, like how much does T1 really have to commit to these upcoming Drake fights? Because normally if you have two Drakes, you're starting to feel really worried as T1. You're starting to feel like the clock is ticking and you need to start utilizing your scaling. 
Um, and the fact that Jinji had these really early is somewhat worrying in a different scenario, but because it's Cloud, I feel like T1 have a little bit more wiggle room as Kana really wants this plate. Yeah, he's pretty desperate. He's going to get it, it too. Yep. Finds it. But, you know, he's going to get decimatingly smashed. There's a oh. range in the area. Gets the flash out from Kana. That one was free. He's now cleared coming on over. He's going to get distracted by a control ward. And you can see the tides are starting to turn, it feels. Have to check on the accounting team whether that plate was worth the flash trade. On yeah. How much flashes are going for these days, but I feel like it might not be worth. Yeah, finances might certainly be, <laughs> uh, be a bit of an issue here. That being said, the extra 160, we'll see where it's going to go towards for Kana, who's now underneath his dead turret. <laughs> that was cute. Cuz is like, that minion is mine, if you don't mind. You, you got the plate. <laughs> uh, Faker getting ulted. And uh, Teddy comes through and says, hey, would you like my heal? Faker's like, do you have seven more? That would be great. Faker is really trying to push the issue here with Dawning Shadow as well. I, I, I think this is fairly realistic. He just cannot get stunned. Yeah, BDD already used his ult, so Faker feels very free to kind of trade like this. Yep, but it is splitting resources just a little bit. I guess center is theoretically a support at this stage, so not a huge deal. As Carrier up towards the top side, he's actually had a fair bit of uh, the solo farm so far. Uh, during this game, you can see uh, two levels ahead of uh, where life is, although life did just ding level eight. Yep. Just a slight edge there. Ruler has been given so much extra gold in this game. I mean, it's insane. Like, he's been able to free farm. He got uh, extra plates on top, was able to get uh, the whole full plates bottom. He's going to get the top turret. It's, it's kind of insane, actually, <laughs> how much gold he has. But the range problem is not something the money can solve. And that's going to be something that Genji need to, to figure out in these mid-game team fights first. Well, he's a big teleport to come through from Rascal as Shirley is the prize. And now T1 get to set up with their poke. Let's see how it's going to be utilized as Clear dodges that spear. Shock Blast absorbed by Rascal, who's now getting tired. And the spear will connect now as well as reset. Shirley is going to reset. And Kana gets to work on this turret. Remember, his W makes it very easy to do a lot of damage to these in a very short period of time. If somebody gets low like this, it's just so hard to team fight as Gen.G anymore. You know, even though they have the they had the positional advantage and they were in prime position with the, you know, the power spike that they have at this point in the game before T1 actually get all their items online, they still just can't do it if T1 gets a free poke like that. Yeah, and I mean this is this is exactly what T1's comp is designed to do, right? You and it gets stand worse. around in the river like this and they are just going to benefit. What did we see so much last game? Everyone's standing around in the river. <laughs> I know the weather's getting warm, but I mean, it's you don't need it that much. You know, we can spend a little bit of time in the mid lane or in you the can't be lane. here. Yeah, Glitz is going to quick draw away. Oh, that bubble was so close to being extremely high value. Shirley, speaking of which, is going to be able to lock down that outer turret in the mid lane. And T1 now thinking about moving towards their next objective that they can set up a uh, control around. Genji, these are the kind of tricks where, you know, because you have two advantage and it's Cloud, I don't know if you need to fight this as Gen.G because you're walking into a team that's chipping away at you every step of your way in. And that's, if, if you get to the Drake, by the time you get there, will you have enough health to fight after that? I don't think the answer is yes. And they are able to dodge that spear, but they need to Stun. come in. Carrier in a little bit of trouble here as Rascal rounds the corner. That is a decent sleep on the ruler, but no one's able to follow up. Carrier tanking so much damage and Rascal not able to find the smash. Now is the Baker. time when T1 thrives, though, as Faker does find Rascal. They've got so much more sustain. Teddy, not a massive amount of mana, but see the damage? Clear getting chunked. Faker darting forward to find Rascal. They still have vision of this, and Rascal is going to get snared. He's still very tanky, so he should be able to get himself out of the way, but has these health bars been taken down low enough? T1 also struggling a little bit. Teddy only has about one more Piercing Darkness available with his mana pool, so both teams Call it a stalemate and we'll back away. I'm getting deja vu, Wolf. What, yeah. was, the, what was the kill score last time? <laughs> it was around the same, zero and one at the early part of the game. It was Genji who had the early kill. But I feel like, Atlas, this is a, a, a scenario where you start to see the problems of Genji's composition already on display this early on. And every time, the crazy thing about this too, look at Kana's CS, he's up 50 right now. Every time they, they scuffle like this and the, the chip damage comes through and Genji tries to sort out a pick, Kana's just pushing mid lane. He always gets mid prio. He gets a ton of extra farm. He's already massively ahead. T1 have a comp that has so much pushing power. They have so much siege as well. So if the end result is a draw at the end of the fight, if it's a killless exchange, T1 get the better push. They get the better vision. They get Drake prio in this case. And the problem just compounds upon itself. You could see that, that in those very short moments where Ruler actually gets in and hits some of those rends, he does a ton of damage. Yeah. But it's just so difficult to do so 
that it might not matter. They might have missed their window to really snowball this game. And we haven't seen any showstoppers really do very much uh, from life as well. Like, yeah. I want to see the set get in there and actually try to put T1 out of position because so far they haven't really been challenged as BDD. Not quite able to find any CC onto Teddy, even if he did, Carrier was there to keep him alive. The Fates Call attempt there, you know, where you send in, <laughs> you send up in, in a knockup, in a yeah. set, then he show stops in, should be enough to guarantee kills at this stage, and the fact that it's not is very concerning, right? Very it needs to be coordinated, right? Like, yeah. if you can do it with Rascal being able to drive a train into T1, like, BDD needs to hit that follow-up scare of the week, right? Yeah. And you, if you can lock down one target, doesn't matter who it is, and kill them, then you can just face roll the, the team fight in most cases with the set. Yeah, and that's why they focus on Carrier, right? Because if they kill him, they kill the Devourer as well, right? He's the most pickable target right now. As uh, Okay, here comes the train. Another flash comes out from Kana. That was already back up since their last fight. His Kemp tank comes down. Great knock up. And Clitch should have the damage for this one. Kana just out of position. Pushing up a little bit too far now, Genji, in a four versus five scenario. But there's four minutes left on this Drake. What are you really fighting for? Yeah, exactly. At this stage of the game, as Faker jumps on over, he'll find the bubble. Uh oh. On to clear as BDD flashes in front of the Battle Star to keep his jungler alive. And now Ruler finds Faker, who may be overextended. Fate's call. He's going to land under the Tom Kent as Faker spent so much time in his belly. But it means that Carrier gives up his life. Scatter the week is good on to Kuz, but that is two picks now for Gen G. Two picks for Gen G, but unfortunately there's a bit of a, you know, objective void here, as you mentioned. Unfortunately, even though they get kills here, there's not much you can yeah. turn this into. They might be able to get the mid turret for this. I think they will. The speaker is still trying to trade something back at the moment. But that was really well played from Gen G. You, you punish Kana, who's out of position, who also lost his flash, which is pretty significant for the upcoming fight. And you can see, again, if you can have that engaged when T1 aren't playing on stable footing, when they aren't playing in this insane front-to-back position where they have so much poke, it's very difficult to actually handle these team fights. So Kana does have to flash the drain, the ult coming through from Rascal. And then Gen G say, okay, I see blood in the water. T1 either have to leave him out to dry or they have to fight. And if they're going to fight, BDD is coming over here too. And then T1 fight a lot here. They stay very long. They try to set up with Baker's flank to get a kill. And then there's just this amazing moment here where BDD says, absolutely not. Oh, Flashes the so Paddle Star. Sick. And they even committed the Teddy's ultimate here to try to get that kill. So a lot of resources used. There's no way out of the Fates call here, unfortunately, for T1 at the stage. Carry has to give his life for the retreat. But it feels like T1 stayed so long to fight for the scraps of this fight. And that's the kind of mistake you can make against a comp like this where Genji can start to snowball a game away from you. If you give them too much agency. Well, BDD gonna get snared up. Life now in position to try to defend. Clid makes his way through, and now Teddy might be out of position. Devour going to be used, but now it's on cooldown. There, Scout of the Week, Kanner is dead once again. And here's the re-engage. Ulti comes through Kuz, goes golden to mitigate it. Clid going to survive, and now the showstopper comes in. He's dead, actually, because there's no face call to keep him alive. However, now Faker could be in trouble, and this is not the kind of fighting that T1 the wants. The turret, though. Roller in trouble, yeah, this... Turret is 100% the MVP as Pierce does a lot of work onto Faker and Genji are bullied out of the way for now. I mean, this is this is where it starts to get scary. I thought we'd already passed the point to where Genji can get picks like this and actually take these fights so decisively and really catch T1 out of position. But T1 are making some very serious mistakes in terms of the positioning. Genji see blood in the water. Their execution of this draft has been so phenomenal that even from behind, they now find themselves with a gold lead now in these very aggressive picks. It's not straight up front to back team fighting. It's just punishing of positional error. As we watch again, you see Kana steps way too far forward into this fight. He chases very significantly. Look at where Clit is. He comes back through. Life is practically immortal at this stage of the game. You can't kill him and Clit Comes over, gets that extra damage on the Kana, and at this point the fight is over. But Gen G know that their win condition is to snowball super hard. They commit the showstopper, everything here. It's actually in the getting a favorable trade. The turret is doing so much damage in yeah. this scenario. Look at all the resources T1 have to use defensively here. It's actually crazy. But at the end of the day, like this is looking better for Genji than I think it should. Yeah, and I actually really love the rulers uh, with the upgraded shield for the, the shield bow. It looked like that turret didn't actually do damage to him. <laughs> um, yeah. It was very, very cute, but uh, of course, that just procced it. 2 0 1 now for the Callista, and you can see why. I mean, this is the Flame Horizon timing uh, for Ruler over Carrier. It's not something like there should always be a CS gap, right? Especially now that uh, Teddy has started farming.
This is a little bit earlier, though, and Ruler is certainly in a very, very good position. I do still find it so difficult to try and conceptualize just, like, how strong the bottom lanes are when it's sent yeah. Tom Kench against X. It is hard. Um, but it feels like Ruler's in a good spot. It, I mean, he's been given so many extra resources, too. So many extra turret plates, for example. It's not just the CS that he was also given his sleep. Does connect. Yep, and life is uh, going to take a hell of a lot of damage. Could There's was. Dawning Shadow and Fate's Call <laughs> mitigates it for now. But that is so many resources just to keep life alive. And now he has to go home anyway. So T1 will be able to grab their second Cloud Drake. And I want to apologize yet again. Like, <laughs> think about if this was... Ocean. If this is Infernal or, or, or Ocean, yeah, it's a different story. I mean, if it's Ocean, it's like infinite mana, and then you just like get all of your health back if you can actually, you know, stay at arm's length from Gen G. Like, that makes it very scary. Cloud Soul, not quite so much, although, you know, more movement speed is good. I just loved in that last out of the way. I loved in that last fight, Clid was like, I am not taking a bullet for you, life. <laughs> you are going to actually eat this Paddle Star. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you end up getting that almost 100 to 0, damage that Faker is going to have, you know, at this stage. He's even now got a Dark Seal because he knows he's really going to start popping off, getting a ton of those stacks, um, and then doing a ton of damage. Like, he's going to get a Horizon Focus soon, too. Yep. You really have to respect that damage, and if anyone gets slept, they're basically dead. I mean, you have the ability to block a lot of that damage as Rascal here, but, I mean, if he's not in a position to do so, and even if he eats the damage, you eat it too much, and then you can't fight anymore. Genji are so reliant on these picks the showstopper, right? The Fate's Call. And when you see it used defensively like we saw in that last fight, you know that Genji just have no opportunity to fight. They have to walk away. But two Drake advantage, that's the buffer you have here. And they've still been able to work into some of these picks where you didn't expect, you know, especially in a, into a poke composition for them to be able to get. They've been able to make it happen when T1 oversteps. So see if they can do it again. Speaking of which, going to get the stun there onto Kuz, who's going to get devoured. Now that is on cooldown. However, they just choose not to walk up the river, and that is absolutely fine. But I like Genji's idea. What Genji can't do is start Baron. If they start Baron, then all of the poke rains on in. What they can do, though, is deny vision and set up the picks around the area. Yes. And we'll see how well they do that. We saw Kuz, for the brunt of it, only has a broken stopwatch. Zonya's going to be on the way very soon. As Life picks up a trap, but not going to get speared. Clear towards the bottom side has a huge advantage when it's, it comes to farm. He is the secondary carry right now. He really is. Set has to stay near the Callista non-stop, otherwise you can't get that Fate's Call value, and that means that he can't be threatening anywhere else. And that is something that's so transparent and so predictable for T1. So they know that if Set is there, Callista has to be nearby, and if she's not, then you know, you're know you not going to do any damage. At this point, they know she backed, and they're going to try to come in here and take away some of this vision. And they're just going to keep chipping away, and it's Rascal who's going to eat the damage. And then this passive moment here really benefits T1. Like, their draft is going to scale up better at this stage than Gen G's does. So, yeah, Gen G can take vision away and just say, you better come over here and, and stop us from doing the Baron that we're definitely not doing. <laughs> and T1 is just not going to be afraid of this. This is a great moment for Kanda to go side lane. Look, that's exactly what he's doing. He's yeah. gone to the bottom side of the map because you don't need him to be here right now. He's got teleport. You don't want him to be here, actually. You want to play 4-1. You, like, you lose team fights as T1. Especially with Rascal being such a big menace in the front line. T1's comp, yes, it can outscale, but it is, it's just, it's very different. The way that these two teams win is different. However, I feel like T1 should be able to, in the late game, force impossible situations onto Gen G that Gen G may not necessarily uh, be able to do themselves. Yeah. Right? So uh, T1 have fashioned themselves some agency. It's just whether or not they can actually make it happen. Look at the resources that are pulled down to deal with Kana. And this time he does not overextend. He knew that the rest of Genji was around Bear and had to back to go deal with him, so he's in a good spot. There's pings showcasing, okay, he's caught to be in the area, but we're probably not going to catch him right now. So many resources given over. And this is part of why Kana was picked twice in this game in the side lane, because while T T1 have to kind of group up otherwise four man to get that poked on to make sure they're not picked by the aggressive, very, very strong early Genji cop. That's what he's going to get value for T1 is in that side lane. He's punished for it, but he's doing his job correctly. And in this later yeah. part of the game where you have that Baron tussle, it's just so much more difficult to rotate somebody over there or multiple players over there to deal with them. So he gets away with it. Yeah, if he wins in a side lane, then it becomes so comfortable for T1, right? Because then they get, just get to threaten Baron, and then they're going to be able to turn and win a three ver uh, oh, no! four versus three. Is Okay, now it's just body blocking. Spear going to connect, Ruler in a little bit of trouble. Does have a lot of lifesteal, so should be able to just use this wave to get himself back up. He did he? Oh no, Kuz! 
Going to get taken down solo. The Primal Surge was decent, but that orb will finish him off. That's the jungler dead. And now Gen G might think about heading towards this Baron. They have good vision control here too, Atlas. I mean, there's nothing for T1. They don't have the vision to actually throw these Power Stars. They have to throw them blind. Well, they have to contest. They have to contest. Faker will be able to get extra vision utilizing his portal jump, but four versus five is so dangerous. Life no smite. are looking for a little bit of a flank, and it is just going to be taken by Gen G. They had the Ren, they had the smite. No way that T1 could answer, and now maybe out of position as Rascal is hurting Teddy and Carrier. The two man face break is beautiful, and now Carrier needs to try and get over the wall, and he spits Teddy out. He might be safe, but BDD says absolutely not and he's going to be able to find him exactly the perfect teleport as Genji, it's, they're actually just, they're, they're farmers, just, they're, they're farmers, they're hurting T1 right now. It's insane, and BDD is playing the series of his life right now. He sets up the pick that goes on to cause at the most critical moment. It's proactive plays like this on the Syndra. We've been talking about it all playoffs. Sometimes Syndra feels like a boring pick, very, sit back and poke, not as interesting as so many of the other mid laners we have, but if you're able to just go forward, hit that Scour of the Week, and set up for a kill like this so consistently, as we've seen, we saw him doing the Orion in game one, now on the Syndra, he's making such a big impact. You can actually make that pick into a Baron winning game move, right? Like, yeah. okay, yeah, Ruler gets caught here, but look where BDD is. This is on vision. Cuz you want to throw another spear? I know where you are. I know where you threw that spear from. <laughs> Goodbye. And life is a perfect follow-up. This is so well played from BDD. And this pick gets you a Baron. Now this you can't fight. so good, though. Like, Jinji just knew exactly what T1's options were and played to precisely what they were going to do. Look at life. He just teleports in and says, bye, Teddy. You had no choice. That's, uh, this is actually extremely difficult to do, extremely difficult to pull off with this low range comp. But it's proactive plays like that around vision control that can that can really set you up for success. I mean, Genji has such a massive lead in this game now. We might be threatening inhibitors. Yeah, this is actually crazy. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, we're 31 minutes into the game and they're still winning team fights. They're still getting picks. This should not be happening. This is the difficulty with the poke comp, though. This is something that we talk about all the time. When you fall behind, the snowball is so much easier. Like. It's a knife's edge style of composition because now, T1, how are you supposed to keep yourself together if Rascal can just walk up and soak everything and he's fine? As uh, this CC needs to come through, right? Like Ruler getting tagged by Teddy, that gives you a lot of time. But Clid getting some spare time with a turret is absolutely not what you want as now T1 stretched a little bit thin and Gen.G sieging this one beautifully despite I mean, their lower range. They are in such a good position here to just take these turrets out. 30 seconds left on the Baron Bob. Oh, look at Flashing on in, finds the face breaker. Faker has to flash out once again. It's going to be Rascal there driving the train forward and Faker nowhere that he could go. Dawning Shadow isn't saving anyone as Carrier falls down as well. Teddy does have a fair bit of damage. There are lower health bars. But Genji just look inevitable right now. They look right like now. they want to end the game right now, Teddy. Oh dear, Rascal just standing in front of him. Yes, that is a hell of a lot of damage, BDD. You have been so good this game, Cuz and Kana against the world. Can they actually do this? But I don't think the answer is yes. Nexus turret number two goes down. Genji moved to 2-0 against T1 in the playoffs. What an unbelievable start here for Genji, and BDD makes it happen again. Decisive plays on the Orianna, decisive plays on the Syndra, and this is the Genji that fans were waiting for. This was the Genji fans were hands clasped.